I, you know, don't always have the privilege or the opportunity to have sermons in a series that you do that's kind of put together for you and you, you, you have to adapt them to yourself and your situation. And um, uh, after last Sunday on Monday when, when I began to uh, prepare myself, actually Sunday afternoon I went home and began to look at the lesson. I've looked at all of them, but I looked at this lesson and um, can I be honest? When I looked over this whole series to begin with and looked at each lesson's title, I thought, I'm going to get somebody else to preach this week because um, it's tough. Almost every week I have felt like that I was talking to me, preaching to me, not preaching just to you, but to me, and then... You know, I didn't realize when I put this series together that this would be appreciation, Pastor Appreciation Day, but I was invited out to dinner today by somebody a few weeks ago, and so I I thought, well, I'm going to have to be there, but then it just hit me on Monday, well, this is the week. I I was looking for a, you know, uh, I was scheduled to preach somewhere Friday and Saturday, uh, of this Thursday, Friday and Saturday of this past week, and I thought, well, you know, that's a good time for me to be gone and do all that and then um, I had a wedding scheduled on uh, yesterday the wedding canceled the meeting canceled and everything you know what I'm saying just just changed and I'm here and y'all listening to me say this I don't want to preach this message I'm going to I will But we're talking about life's healing choices, and today the title of this particular message is The Relationship Choice. The Relationship Choice. Now, everyone on the planet has broken relationships. In our own pain, in our Uh, woundedness we can build walls in our life to keep out pain one of the things that a lot of us do when we've been hurt or we've been offended or we've been wounded is we'll build a wall around us saying that we're uh, not going to be hurt again or I'm not going to be wounded again or I'm not going to let anybody in that close again I'm not going to let somebody in one of the things that we learned yesterday is in one of the schools where they built walls to keep everybody out, kept kids locked in and they couldn't get away from the shooter. So building walls that we think sometimes are for protection can be something that's not always a protector. But when we build a wall to protect ourselves from being hurt, Um, We end up locking ourselves in a prison and people are on the outside. Now when I understand this concept and I understand what I'm talking about today and I begin to look and part of the thing is that many of us unintentionally because we've been hurt, we've been offended, we've gone through things, we've experienced pain in certain ways. Again, we build a wall and we don't realize one day when we get this wall erected around us that we're in jail, we're in prison, we're locked in and we can't get out and nobody can get in to where we are and our heart becomes a certain way and it, it's, it's, it's there. And so these walls exist. And again, um, we end up sometimes with walls between us and God. We sometimes end up with walls between us and other people. Everybody just say Walls. Now this series is Life's Healing Choices, so we're talking every week about choices. Right choices open up possibilities. Wrong choices can close doors. Making a choice to build a wall around your soul, to build a wall around your heart, to build a wall of protection, you have to understand what happens when you make that choice. and You have to understand what takes place. 
But today, in talking about the relationship choice, we have two Beatitudes that we're looking at in today's message, and we'll read those from Matthew chapter 5 and verse 7. First of all, it says, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain... Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Now again... If you're not merciful, you probably are not going to obtain mercy. Walls. Matthew 5 and verse 9 is the second beatitude that says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are the merciful, and blessed are the peacemakers. This word blessed, as we said, literally means happy. Happy are the merciful because they obtain mercy and happy are the peacemakers for they shall be called sons or children of God. Now today I want you and I to have an opportunity to make a choice. In our time together in the next few moments and I'll try not to be lengthy but I want to be clear in what I believe God has to say. And again, I, I want you to understand I'm not preaching at anyone, but I know that I will be talking to everyone. I know that I will be saying and addressing things going on in every one of our lives. And um, so as we have the opportunity today to make a choice in this time that we have together, you will have an opportunity today to evaluate relationships. You will have an opportunity uh, uh, to offer forgiveness to those who have hurt you. You're going to have an opportunity to just offer forgiveness to them. You're going to have an opportunity today to uh, um, make amends for the harm that you've done to others. Do, do, you, do you realize, uh, Buddy and Angeli, it's so good to have you home today. I just, I meant to say something, but it's great to have you all home. Do you realize how many times we have been the weapon of injury to other people? I I just know at times we say things, we do things. My family has looked at me, my wife has looked at me, my children look at me and said, Dad, you don't realize how you come across sometimes. You don't realize how abrupt you can be. You don't realize the tone in which you talk or the authority with which you stand on things. And it's not my intention, it's not my heart, but there are times that we say things or do things and hurt other people with the words that come out of our mouths. And we've been hurt. This week in the small groups, this Wednesday, it's going to be a great session because we're, we're going to talk about making amends and how you can make amends uh, in the small groups this week. It's going to be one of the things that we do. But how many of you realize that if we all in this room, every one of us, sat down and begin today, this moment, and we started to write down every time in our lifetime that someone has hurt you, or offended you, or wounded you, if we would get out pencil and paper and start every one of us writing down from things that happened in kindergarten on the playground, things that uh, uh, took place when you were uh, uh, young, when you were a child, the things that, that, that you know, I, I got to thinking about this, and I remember when I was in the first grade, there was a boy that heard me say something and do something, and he said, I know your mom, and I'm going to tell your mommy what you say, so you're going to have to give me a nickel every day to keep me from telling your mother. Now, some of you don't believe this, but I did that for a while. And then one day I came to school without the nickel. Didn't have any money. And I decided right then, we got a problem. Well, I stood up to him. No. (laughs) No. He said, I'm bigger than you. Yeah, I I looked, I said, I'm going to start in at your knees and just keep going up. That's what I'm going to (laughs) do. But I stood up to him. 
But it hurt me. It offended me. It bothered me. I was afraid. We sometimes find ourselves in fear because we're in situations. But if we sat down and started to make a list of every hurt, every wound, every offense that each of us have ever experienced in this room, all of the different ways that we've been hurt, the ways that we realize that we've hurt other people and the time that we've hurt other people, if we did that, it would be an enormous list and it would probably take us weeks, if not months, to write down every wound or every hurt that has affected us. So when I talk about this, the main reason that we get hurt, the main reason that we hurt is because Listen carefully. We don't always know how to love well. Some of the people we love the most, I won't say some, the people we love the most is who we hurt the most and who hurt us the most. And part of the reason is, and I'm just, I'm saying it for you to get this, is we don't love well. We want to love. We want to express our love. We feel feelings of love. But there are times that we just don't love well. Well, in Matthew, the 18th chapter, Jesus tells a story, uh, a very profound story about forgiveness. I want to just read this to you. We'll put it on the screen, but I want to read the story to you because I want you to hear it carefully, and it, it'll take me a couple of minutes, but I want you to just follow along. In Matthew 18, beginning at verse 21, then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him? Up to seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. I think Peter thought he was being generous when he said seven times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And when he had begun to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. But as he was not able to pay, his master commanded that he be sold with his wife and children, and that he had, and, and all that he had, and that payment be made. The servant therefore fell down before him, saying, Master, have patience with me, and I will pay you all. Then the master of that servant was moved with compassion, released him, and forgave him the debt. But that servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. Now, I've read different things, but if I could put this in perspective the way one of the things that I read said, this guy was forgiven a hundred thousand dollar debt and this guy was calling in a ten dollar debt. That's kind of the scenario of what's going on here. We don't understand all these terms, but that's what it was. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat saying, Pay me what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him saying, Have patience with me, I will pay you all. And he would not, but went and threw him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what he had done, they were, very, very, they were very grieved and came and told their master all that had been done. Then his master, after he had called him, said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant just as I had pity on you, and his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due him. So my heavenly Father also will do to you if each one of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. If you remember, 
in the story or in the, the teaching of Jesus when he was teaching his disciples, they said, how do you pray? And he was teaching them to pray and he says, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Now, Jesus here in this scripture tells this story for a reason. And there are two thoughts here. The principle that Jesus is trying to give, the principle that he's trying to teach, the principle that Jesus shared is, is so simple. And, and, and I realize that it's simple. And the principle is, number one, here's what it is. Because I have been forgiven, I can forgive. Because I have been forgiven, I can forgive. Say that with me, would you? Because I have been forgiven, I can forgive. Now the foundation for us to be able to forgive this huge catalog, as I said, if we sat down and wrote everything down where we've been hurt, that we've been offended, where we've been wounded, where things have, have hurt, hurt us and the wounds that we have all accumulated in this room, if we were uh, 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 the, the foundation to forgive all of those things that we would put uh, on this that have been accumulated, all of this is, is the reason for us to forgive is because we have been forgiven. Say that with me. Say, I have been forgiven. And because we have been forgiven, then we are able... To forgive. Now guys, today I really want you to see this story. I really want you to understand this story because I believe this story is a story that Jesus wanted us to be acquainted with. I think it's a story that Jesus wanted us to know. This is not talking about salvation. He's not talking just about uh, a salvation. He's talking about a principle here. You've been forgiven. You're saved. Your, your sins are washed. They're gone. You've been forgiven a great debt. Therefore, your sin is gone. You're in a right relationship. And he's talking about now that you're in a right relationship with God, what should we do? How should we behave? What should we do as believers in Jesus, as Christians who are walking? What should our attitude be towards those who have offended us? So here is a servant who worked for a very wealthy king. Now, he doesn't know it, but the morning he gets up and, and the king realizes that he's going to see him or he does see him and he calls him in, he gets up that morning and it's, it's judgment day for him because, uh, you know, he's just trucking along, going through life, doing what life has for him to do. And all of a sudden, he gets the word that the king wants to see him. So he goes in to see the king, and, and, and the king sees that he owes him. And again, there's different places that you read different things, but my understanding is uh, that it's around $100,000 in today's world of what we would know that, that he owed him. And, and um, he doesn't know how it got there. He doesn't say anything about how he got into that kind of debt, but $100,000 uh, was a lot of money. It was a lot of wealth. It is today. It's a lot of money in that day. And, and here he was in this... Huge debt. And the king says, I want you to pay now. And if you don't pay now, I'm going to put you and your wife and your children in prison. And I'm going to take everything that you owe until, everything you own, I'll take it from you until you can pay me this debt. And the guy falls on his face, it says, and he begs for mercy. And he says, please, please, don't do this to me. Well, we don't know the reason, but for some reason, the king, in his generosity, all of a sudden decides, you know what, I'm going to let you go. I'm not only going to, going to, to give you more time, I'm going to forgive you. I'm going to wipe the debt away. I'm going to take all of this away, and, and I'm going to wipe it off the books. It's done. I release you from this debt. And this guy who just get freed, he is free from everything. Now, stop with me and think just a moment. Follow my thought process. What is the same 
scenario. When you think about it, this scenario is me and you when we stand before God. We owed a debt we couldn't pay. He paid a debt he didn't owe. Jesus didn't just die for me and you. He died as me and you. He took our place. He paid our debt. You and I owe a debt to the king, to God, that was an unpayable debt. There had to be a sinless sacrifice. None of us could give a sinless sacrifice. We owe him a debt that is gigantic, and we can't pay it. Listen to me. If we worked as hard as we could, we couldn't pay the debt. If we kept every commandment there was to keep, we couldn't pay the debt. If we never said an unkind word. If we gave all that we had to feed the poor. Take care of the homeless. If we were never grumpy. Y'all never grumpy, are you? If we were always sweet and kind and loving and always did the right thing, we still owed a debt that was unpayable. So, in this story, we have a story of a king who made a decision to forgive. And Jesus is the one telling the story. And, and, and we've got to ask ourselves the question, well, why does God forgive me? Why is it that God chooses to all of a sudden tell us and to prepare a place for us that we can receive forgiveness for all of the sin? Why would God have mercy on us? Well, there's only one reason that God would have mercy on us, and it's because of Jesus. Do you understand that? It's because of Jesus. Do you know what Jesus did? Jesus said, I take your sin. People who look at me and say, I just don't understand what y'all what, what see in this Jesus. What do you get out of this Jesus? Why do you serve this Jesus? Why do you follow this Jesus? It's because they don't understand what Jesus has done for the sins of the world. It was because of this Jesus. Now listen to me say this. The debt of my sin doesn't remain inside of me unpaid. My sin debt has been paid. He died for my sin. He died as me and you. My sin and its penalty has been paid. I can't add anything to what he has done. Now watch. The debt that you owe. If you have accepted Jesus Christ, your debt does not remain unpaid. It is paid. It is finished. You couldn't pay it. I couldn't pay it. But Jesus did. Now. Because of what Jesus did in taking on the debt that I owe, God had mercy on me and you. While I'm here for a moment, I want to sidetrack just briefly. I'm not going to read the whole story, but I want to talk just a second about the prodigal son. Because the prodigal son, as you know, went to his father he was in the family. He was already part of the family. He had a brother in the family. He was not some outsider. He was not a sinner, if I could say it that way. He was in the family, and he went to the Father and said, I want what's mine. And we're in the family of God. We've come to God. And we said, God, I want what's mine. But the son, the prodigal son, took what the father gave him, gave him his inheritance, and he went out, 
And it says he consumed and ruined everything that he had on riotous living. In other words, he took everything that the father had given him. He took his inheritance. He took what was given to him and he went out and he blew every bit of it. Now we can talk about things, but some of us who've been in the family of God for a while, some of us who've walked with God for a while, some of us that God has done some great and mighty things for, there are times that we take what He has given us and we kind of do what we want with all that we have and we've kind of ruined some of the stuff or wasted some of the stuff that He's given us. Would you not agree with that? Some of the gifts, some of the talents, some of the abilities, some of the wealth, some of the things that God has provided for us, we have wasted much of it. Just like the prodigal son did. And, 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 you know, the point that I want to bring about with this, that when the son decided to go back home, I want you to understand that the father was waiting for him, looking for him. It amazes me how many people have been in the family of God and they serve God and they do something wrong. They make mistakes. They get themselves into a jam or into a situation and they think God's mad at them. They think that God's not interested in them. They think that God doesn't care about where they are or what they've done. I want you to understand if you think that you're away from God, God knows exactly where you are. He's looking for you to come to Him every day of your life. He wants to restore the fellowship with you that He once had. He wants that relationship with you. He is not pushing you away. Just like this father who was waiting for the prodigal, God is waiting for you. All of us who have been in God's family blows it sometimes. We make mistakes. Look at somebody and say, he's talking to you now, not me, will you? We all make mistakes, but listen to me. Our Heavenly Father is waiting patiently and eagerly, scanning the horizon for some sight of His child. God is not like some parents. I know a lot of parents who have an attitude, how dare you come back to me? Don't you know you've broken my heart? Don't you know what you've done? You have trashed everything that we hold dear. You don't understand that you have held us to ridicule in the community. You have behaved in a manner that is unacceptable. We as human beings at times find ourselves in a position with our own children that we don't like their behavior, we don't like what they do, we don't like how they behave, but we can't take an attitude of a human being. We've got to have the heart of God where we keep our heart in a position where we say, you are always welcome in this home. We've got to have that kind of an attitude. Listen to me, your children have not brought more shame to your name than, God, than you have brought to God's name in some of your behaviors. Help me, Lord. I've let my Savior down more than I want to admit. I've not behaved in ways that I should more times than I could ever or that I would ever want people to know. But he never turns his back on us. I'm just saying to you today, you need to get the nerve to walk back in his door. Do you realize how many people are out here don't darken the door of a church somewhere because we've judged them and we've had attitudes towards them and we've expressed things about where they are and how they do that they don't feel comfortable in the house of God. They don't feel like they can be around other Christians and they will love them and accept them for the way they are. We have built a ministry that believes in love, that believes in acceptance and believes in forgiveness and we've got to continue to love, to, ex to forgive and to accept people. We have to do that, guys. It's what God has called and equipped this body to do. But because we have these feelings and these attitudes, sometimes we think that's how God feels about us because we get embarrassed, because we don't like the behaviors of some of those around us. We as earthly parents get this attitude. Now, 
These two Bible stories that I'm talking about here, one with the king who has forgiven his servant, the other story of the prodigal son, the king who sees the debt, it's enormous, he wipes it away, and a father who sees his child waste what he has given him, but he waits for him with open arms. Ask yourself this question today. Why does God treat us with such kindness? When I started talking about this, I said, we don't love well. We think we do. But we don't love well. We don't love like God loves. We don't love in the same vein of God's love. You know, in Psalm 103 and verse 1, it says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless His holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Now, here's the part I want you to get. And all that is within me. Look at me. Do you know how every one of us have some caves on the inside of our souls that are full of garbage? When we say, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all. I heard a preacher yesterday. Said he studied Greek for five years. And he said, I want you to understand that the Greek word all. In the Greek, it means all. Not just what you think it means. It means all. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. All that is in my innermost being. I believe that some of us have layers and layers and layers deep within our soul where there's some junk. You know, it amazes me. I'm talking about your mind. You're with me. It amazes me how I can have heard something way back in the resources of my life, back even before I began walking with the Lord, and all of a sudden something will happen in a situation and some old dirty, some old filthy, some old ugly thing will pop into my mind that I've experienced. And before I know it, I've said something or done something I shouldn't have. Oh, I'm sure that's none of you. Junk. Garbage. In our soul, in those caves, in those deep parts of our innermost being, there is some pathetic and awful things. We have some stuff in there. We've got some stuff in there that we keep hidden from each other. Has anybody ever hurt you and you think you're going to get even? And you think of things, of what you could do? And how could you do it and nobody know it? Hello? Now, Pastor, you're not talking about any of us. Yeah, I am. It's people you love. People you're married to. I can't tell you the times. I've been upset at Sheila. I can remember especially when the kids were little. It's like, I ain't taking this no more. I am leaving. And then I'd stop and I'd think, wait a minute, I ain't leaving the kids. I can leave you. I ain't leaving these kids. Wonder how I could make her the bad person. <laughs> Y'all never thought them thoughts, have you? Huh? All you sweet, pure people. <clears throat> But 
listen to me say this, very few of you really know the depth of the ugliness in somebody sitting around you right now. In the church shootings, I believe the figure is either 86 or 68 percent are people who are connected with the church. It's not always some outsider, weirdo, you got to worry about. percentage of those whose family was going through a divorce and somebody from the one of the people involved in the divorce comes to a church and does things it's, it's, it's enormous the percentages are it's unbelievable what you see what you hear very few of us realize the ugliness that we have in our souls but here's what I want you to see today God sees it all God knows it all. And he still loves you. Just the way you are. Help me. Aren't you glad that he sees what's in our hearts and doesn't run from us, but he opens his arms to us? He says things like, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. I'll give you rest. Take my yoke. Learn of me. I'm meek and low. I will walk with you when everybody else quits you, when everybody else gives up on you, when everybody else stops. I want you to understand, he will never leave you nor forsake you. He is there for you. He sees the places where you struggle. He sees the places where you hurt. He sees the places where you question Him, where you question uh, salvation, where you question the Bible. He sees every doubt that you have. He understands those doubts. He sees where you've cried in agony. He sees it all. And He doesn't run. He loves you. He has graced you. He has had mercy on us. Now because He has treated us this way, and because He takes us the way we are, this story today and this message today is really Him saying, look, because I treat you the way I treat you, I'm just asking you to do the same to other people. That's really what this story is all about. What he's really saying is, look, you know, I don't want you to treat people the way you feel that they have upset you and made you feel. Don't retaliate back to them. He said, I have forgiven you. I haven't ran from you. I haven't done anything but love you. And all I'm asking you to do is give to other people the same thing I am giving you. So, Here it is, guys. Because I've received mercy and forgiveness from God, I can forgive others. I started this message. Thank you. I started this message by telling you and being honest with you that I didn't want to preach this message. Because even though I know that I have received forgiveness and that I can forgive I don't always want to. Come on. Let's talk about it, huh? I understand it. I've always, I've preached this numerous times. I've read this story hundreds of times through the years. I know that He has forgiven me a bunch, but I want to tell you something. When you hurt me or when you hurt my children, you got to understand I got a problem. When somebody hurts one of you, it's my church. I I was somewhere there day and somebody was talking about somebody that goes to this church. And they were just giving them down the road. 
They were just really letting him have it. And I looked at him and I said, let me, let, me, let me help you with something. I just want you to know. They go to Rama Christian Center and I'm their pastor. Well, that just provoked them worse. Well, I don't give a blah, 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 blah. That's what they are. That's how they are. I says, well, I don't give a blah, 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 and I never used any words. I just went blah, 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 because they went blah, blah, back, and the preacher can't go blah, blah, blah. <laughs> I wanted to. <laughs> I said, but I want you to know, I love them, God loves them, and they are forgiven. You need the same forgiveness. Well, I don't want to forgive them. And I said, I understand that. And that's why I can stand in front of you today and I can look at you and say, God has forgiven me of so much and I want every bit of His forgiveness that I can get. I need His forgiveness in so many ways, so many times. I need, it. But I don't always want to give to other people the same thing He gives me. Is that clear? That ought to help some of you because if you're honest and not being religious. Oh, I'm never that way, Pastor. I'm always sweet and kind. I'm always forgiving of others. <clears throat> because I've received mercy, because I've received forgiveness, because I've gotten all of these things from God, I can forgive others. Say that with me. Say, I can forgive others. It's real simple. It's A plus B equals C. God forgives me. I forgive you. Simple. It ain't that simple. If it was that simple, we would all do it. We don't. And if it bothers you that I'm being honest and tell you I don't like to forgive sometimes. I'm sorry. But I don't. You know. My mother was a pouter. You all know what a pouter is. P-O-U-T-E. You understand what a pouter. She would pout. My brother would pout. I don't ever pout. I see me act like my brother and my mother sometimes and I'm thinking I hated it when they did me that way. But I do it. Huh? <laughs> ah. Talia was here one day and I was acting a certain way and she came in there to Ann and Stephanie and she goes, I'm sorry for how dad acts sometimes. And Ann says, well, honey, he can pout if he wants to. He has feelings just like us. Thank you, Ann. <laughs> I, I, I'm trying to say this in a way that I want you to understand that if we're honest, we don't always like to forgive. And, and I'm really not talking about people out in the community or the people you work with. I'm really talking about a big barrier in personal relationships that we have with our mates. I'm talking about how we are as a parent. I'm talking about how I am as a pastor. How you are as whatever it is you do. I'm talking about our close relationships. We sometimes hold grudges. Not an amen, it was dead silent. <laughs> That's when you know you're preaching good. Can I tell you, the biggest barrier that I have in all of my relationships is me. I was talking to somebody and they said, you know, I got a problem here, I got a problem over here, I got a problem... 
with this family member. I got a problem over here. And I said, do you know what the common denominator is in every one of your problems? There's a common denominator here. And it's you. Help me, Lord. So God forgives me, but I always don't forgive others. My question to you is, could that be dangerous? Could it be dangerous that you and I think that we don't have to do something we don't like to do and that we may choose to not forgive somebody because you don't know how they treated me and what they did to me. If you understood what they did to me, if you really knew what happened, if you really heard what they said, if you really saw what they did, if you really knew what they did to me, I don't think you could forgive them either. Well, that leads me to the second principle here, which is the second truth. And that is this. The unforgiving become the unforgiven. The unforgiving become the unforgiven. Now, let me just picture this story again. Let's go back to the king and the servant, the very first story I read. The servant receives forgiveness from the king. He leaves the king's chamber. He's happy. He's excited. He's thrilled. He is so glad because the king has forgiven him. Again, a $100,000 debt. His debt has been forgiven. He is a happy man. He, uh, uh, he, he, he's a... Um, wonderful, excited person at this moment. His family is free. His wife and kids aren't going to prison. But as he steps down the road and he walks down the road, he sees a guy that he remembers owes him $10. Now think about this for a moment. He goes up to the guy and says, pay me now. The guy says, please, I, I owe you. I understand I owe you. I know that I owe you. But please, please, the same response that he had given the king just a few moments before, asking the king to forgive him, he pleads with him and he says, pay now or go to prison. But the guy did not forgive. He puts the guy in prison. And my question is, can you see any of us here? Can you see the fact that any of us behave the same way this servant behaved? You see, when it comes to my sin, my weakness, my failure, and the way that I've harmed people in my life or the way I've treated people in my life, I want mercy. I can't tell you the times I've had to go to people I love, to people in this church, and I've had to say, you know what, I'm sorry. I said something I shouldn't have said. I behaved in a way that wasn't right. I did something I should not have done. I ask you to forgive me. I've said things to my children I've had to ask for forgiveness. All of us have been there. And here this guy... Here's this ungrateful servant, the king, the king. You know, if you could understand, here's how we feel. You hurt me, you need to pay. Do you know what you did to me? You wounded me. You need to pay for what you did. I'm angry and I deserve to be angry. Do you understand I deserve to be angry? You did me wrong. I'm going to make you pay for it. All of these catalog of hurts that we have, we deal with the emotion of that thing. So the Bible says that this guy threw him into the prison, and when the king got word of it, 
because of how he had behaved, because he, what he had done, he called him back to him and he threw him into prison which was called to the tormentors. The word that's used there is tormentors. Now guys, listen to me. What I believe he's saying is if you don't forgive, you're building a wall around your heart that puts you into prison yourself. God didn't put you there. You build a wall where nobody can get in. And the problem with nobody getting in, then when you don't feel love, when you don't receive love, when you don't have love, when people quit loving you, it's because you put a wall up where nobody can get in to express the love they want to get because you are protecting yourself from that love. And all of a sudden you realize, I'm not going to be hurt again, so I'm in a prison to my own emotions, my own feelings. If you hold on to resentment, if you hold on to bitterness, if you hold on to unforgiveness, you will build a wall around your heart and it'll become an emotional prison. Now quickly what I want to do is I want to show you that what I'm teaching is not just one isolated story from Scripture. Okay, let me just show you this. In Matthew 5 verse 7, which was our verse... It tells us, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Next verse. Matthew 8 or 6, 14 says, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Chapter 11. But if you do not forgive their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive them. Sorry. At that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent and have revealed them to babes. It's obvious that was the wrong one. Luke, that I put the wrong one down. Judge not, and you shall not be judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. The last one, James 2.13. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Listen to me say this. As long as you hold unforgiveness in your heart, you are the one that is chained to the unforgiveness. You think you're harming the other person when you are the one who's chained to the unforgiveness. Help me, Rick. You know what we're doing? We give unforgiveness, bitterness, wounds, hatred, strife. We give them rent-free space in our mind. And let them stay there forever and ever rent free. They ain't paying you squat. You will beget, you will get emotional shackles in our heart. And I promise you they will torment you in the night. Now, John Perkins made a statement. And he said, the saddest people I know are those who are unable to forgive. The best analogy that I can give you today of unforgiveness is it's like a bed sore. Without getting too detailed or too gross, what I would like for all of you to know that while the surface of somebody is dealing with something, a bed sore can get to bothering you and be something that is there that you can't see. Nobody knows it's there, but it's getting away. And when that bed sore works its way to your bone, your bone can cause you to become septic, sepsis, take over, and it can literally kill you. When my brother was in the hospital, that was one of the biggest things, along with everything else, was eight months in the hospital, the bed sore. I can remember going in there, 
And he'd say, will you help me? Will you treat me with this? Will you help me with this? I cried over and over again. And what I'm saying to you is unforgiveness is like a bed sore. Everybody else can't see it. Everybody else doesn't know it's there. You can smile and put on your happy face, but I want you to understand you're laying there and you think it's because you did nothing. But the whole while underneath the surface, something's going on. So today I want you to know it's time. Time is here. What do you mean, Pastor? It's time to forgive. It's time for you and I to make a choice. I will forgive. But what if I get hurt again? What if this person... What, 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 what if... What if you're in torment. What, 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 if I, what if I let somebody get... What, what, what if they do... What if they... What if... What if? You're in torment. You're carrying something. I've, I've done it. I've just, I, somebody, somebody's got to be in charge of this thing and somebody's got to hold it against them. His name's the devil. <laughs> if you want to be on his side. He's not in God's family. He's not in God's kingdom. God says, think about what I have forgiven you. And it's time to release the offender. What do you mean, Pastor? It's time to stop telling the story. I was telling my story the other day. And in the middle of telling my story of what happened to me, the Lord said, stop. Don't say another word. And today, I know it's time for you and me to let it go. You know what they did to me? You're not here today by an accident. God knew today was the message, and as I've already said, I, I, I really, Jason, I thought you could do a much better job than I could at this. Sam, I knew that you could get up and talk all about this because you just, you just forgive everybody of everything. <laughs> There's so many of you could get up and talk about what I'm talking about today. You should have preached this sermon, Ryan. Forgiveness. It's time to forgive. Now, C.S. Lewis made the statement, and he said, to be a Christian means to forgive the inexcusable because God has forgiven the inexcusable in you. So, how do we forgive? What do we do? How do we do this? Well, there's all kinds of ways we can do it, and I don't have a pet answer, I don't have a simple thing, but the first thing you've got to do is you've got to understand that whatever it is you're holding against somebody else, you need to nail it to the cross. I want you to understand that what Jesus did on the cross for you, he did for them. He took their sin to the cross just like he took your sin to the cross. And you can't pick and choose which ones you're going to hold on to and which one he didn't pay for. And because he's paid for every sin that everyone has ever committed and he's done it, he's saying, because I've done it for you, I want you to do it. I'm not saying it's easy and I'm not saying you want to do it. But I'm saying if we talk to the Lord, we can do it. I really believe that 
Come on, yes, Steve. I really believe that forgiveness is a barometer of your walk with the Lord. Really believe that. You know, we think going to church, going to meetings, going to uh, paying our tithes, uh, uh, helping the poor, giving to things, doing all these, we think that's a barometer of how much we do for God when all of those things are great indicators. In there. But if you can't forgive like He forgave, how can you be like Him? Peacemakers are sons of God, daughters of God, children of God, those who come to make peace. We are not here to hold people accountable. Let me help you with something. The person who offended you don't deserve your forgiveness. But neither do you deserve God's forgiveness. They don't deserve it. You don't give it to them. Forgiveness is not about deserving it. It's about you choosing to be like God and give Him. So, if you really want to know how deep your walk with God is, I want to know how quickly, how easily, and how completely you forgive. Don't start telling me what you've done. Don't start telling me what you've accomplished. How much can you be like him? An unforgiving Christian is an oxymoron. How can you receive his forgiveness and not give him forgiveness when you've heard what he said? So, stand with me right now, would you please? Thank you, Sharp. Thank you. As I've already said, I didn't want to preach this message. But I stand before you right now with a grateful heart to a God, to a Savior, to a Heavenly Father who loves me who accepts me, who forgives me, who walks with me, who I can run to, who I can depend on, who I can count on, who I can lean on, who I can always trust to know that no matter what I'm feeling or what I'm going through, He will always be there with His arms wide open. and He'll always forgive. And I so desperately want to be like Him. I so much want to walk in His shoes. I so much want to be what He is to people who need that. You see, the people who really know what it is to be forgiven are those who have been forgiven much. Some of us, we get in our goody-goody two-shoes and we don't see ourselves for how bad we really are. We don't understand. But today I stand before God with a grateful heart. And I'm grateful for the price that he paid for my sin and your sin. And I can look every one of you square in the eye right now. And I can tell you that there is nothing that you've ever done. Nothing you've ever said. There's no way that you've ever behaved that he will not forgive you for. He will forgive you for every sin, every iniquity, everything that you've ever done. And he will forgive everybody else on this planet the same way. So today I'm going to ask you if you would to just simply open up your heart right now and would you take your unforgiveness to the cross and would you just simply say, Lord, I don't know what to do, but I'm bringing it to you. You died for this sin on the cross. You died for this person on the cross. And so, Lord, I just bring it to you right now. Would you in your own way just do that with me right now? Would you just openly pray right now to him and say, Lord, I bring my unforgiveness to you. Lord, this is the person. You can, you can think about the person. You can talk about it. I don't know how I'm going to get it out, Lord, but I'm going to. I'm grateful. I want to release this thing. I want to tear down this wall. 
Some of you, it might do you good to write it down. It might do you good to write down the person that you are harboring unforgiveness. And it might do you good to just tear it up, rid it up, rip it up, wad it up, throw it away, get it out of your life, do whatever you need to do. There were times when we've had a cross in here and we would nail things to the cross, but we need to get it out of our lives. Some of you, here's what you need to say. You just need to say, Jesus, I don't even know what all of this means, but I'm tired of running. I'm coming. Would you welcome me home? Would you let me come into your presence? Would you let me receive your forgiveness again? I'm tired of carrying this unforgiveness in my life. And I need to be set free from this chain of guilt that is around me. Could I be part of your family, Lord? Could you open your arms to me? Lord, I just thank you for this body today. I thank you, Lord, for your forgiveness. And I thank you, Lord, that we can walk in forgiveness to others. So, Lord, I just surrender it now to you. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name.